We began in a perfect fever to strain our eyes for Rome. And when, after another mile or two, the Eternal City appeared at length in the distance, it looked like, I am half afraid to write the word, like London. That was Charles Dickens um, in his brilliant um, account of uh, a, a travel across the continent, pictures from Italy. Um, and Dominic, maybe come back to pictures from Italy because it's, it, well, it's so Dickensian. It's full of all his kind of comedy <laughs> and, and energy. Um, but <laughs> the um, the tradition of British tourists going abroad and basically <laughs> deciding that uh you know all these kind of wonderful places and cities um remind them of home is a noble tradition yeah. is it not um it is indeed and- i think uh, william morris <laughs> does, will be doing that later in this episode really <laughs> right um so because this is the middle of august um it's uh, it's the traditional time for people to go on holiday uh we thought that we would do um a series of episodes on the history of holidays and in the first part we were looking at um the 18th century the grand tour much more aristocratic uh, way of going on holiday because basically you had to be incredibly rich and well connected for it to be possible but dominic we've come now to the uh to the 19th century and we ended uh, yesterday's episode with lord byron going to waterloo and um musing in a kind of gloomy and profound way, putting it up into poetry, all that kind of stuff. But in fact, I mean, he was absolutely not the only person going to the battlefield of Waterloo, was he? Uh, it, not it, at all. The battlefield became a kind of one of the first great centres of tourism. It was, absolutely. So um, I think the, the, the figure is that uh, there, are, there are about 600 British visitors a day were arriving in in Paris or in Brussels, the, sort of in the aftermath of the Battle of Waterloo. Um, they're very excited to see all the all the bigwigs who are uh, making the peace, uh, but particularly keen to go and see the battlefield. So obviously they're going on on boats. Um, they go inevitably to to Brussels and they have parties, just as people were doing before the battle itself happened. But then the extraordinary thing is, even as the battlefields are still littered with the sort of body parts of thousands upon thousands of British. Prussian, Frenchmen, you know, the, the flower of Europe. People are pouring over the battlefields for souvenirs. So the most famous example is Walter Scott. Walter Scott and his son, John, they go to the very farmhouse, which is called La Belle Alliance, where Wellington and Blucher had met in the sort of aftermath of, of um, Waterloo. And there are already people staying in this farmhouse, you know, straight wow, away. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, yeah, they, they just basically people immediately want to go and stay there. And Walter Scott buys uh, some armor from a dead Frenchman. So the people there are basically flogging the, the body parts and the sort of relics. It's not tourism, is it? But they're also flogging them to Yorkshire farmers to use as fertilizer. To use as fertilizer. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's slightly um, <laughs> the quest for fertilizer is <laughs> It's a, it's more industrial than than holiday based, but yeah, they they buy the Scots buy this um, uh, this armor which they take back to Abbotsford to their sort of to their sort of manorial seat um, to exhibit, and obviously people have done that actually ever since. So when I was in um, Mostar in Bosnia about ten years ago, there were stalls selling uh, bullets, may and shells that had been made into pen holders. <laughs> And things of that right. ilk. Yeah. Um, and that sort of ghoulishness, I mean, has always yeah. been there. So, I mean, we're jumping ahead a little bit, but um, during the Boer War, before the Boer War was even over, our travel agencies, and we'll be talking about the birth of travel agencies in a little while, they were advertising tours at the Boer War battlefield while the war was still going on, which just seems right. extraordinary. Yeah. Well, could we, um, could we just pull the camera back a bit? So we've talked about how the end of the Napoleonic Wars, suddenly um, it's like a, a kind of cork pop, popping out of a champagne bottle. H- hordes of British tourists suddenly flooding across the continent. Why is it that it happens at this moment? Because I, I had kind of assumed that this was it, but I was very relieved to uh, read it by someone who really knows her stuff, which is um, Lucy Lethbridge, who has a brilliant book that's just come out called Tourists, that um, I knew we were going to be doing this subject, and I saw a review of it in the Times, and it was kind of effusive. And 
went and rushed out, got it. Uh, and it's so good. And I know you've reviewed it for the Sunday Times. I've reviewed it myself, Tom. I've reviewed it for the Sunday Times. I think it's a, um, it's an absolutely wonderful book because it's sort of, it's a look at um, the 19th and early 20th centuries and the invention of mass tourism. Basically, I guess you would argue by the British. And it covers everything from um, from souvenirs and guidebooks to uh, to sort of uh, travel agencies and sexual misbehavior and holiday camps and the whole kind of panorama. It's a really, really fun read. Yeah, it's very funny often, but also kind of, you know, very compassionate, brings all kinds of different expert travel experiences alive. It's a fabulous book. So uh, Lucy Lethbridge, tourists, can't recommend it highly enough. And uh, Lucy, if you're listening, we apologize for <laughs> the fact that an awful lot of what's going to follow <laughs> derives from your wonderful book. Well, it's a great book. And actually, one of the points that she makes is that actually, most for most people, the their time off work actually declined for a lot of the 19th century. So, you know, the, she gives the example of Bank of England holidays. Uh, so bank, there are actually far fewer Bank of England holidays um, in the 1830s. So that's why bank holidays. Yeah, bank holidays. And there had been 100 yeah. years earlier. And for people who are working in, you know, the the massively expanding kind of factories and shipyards and mines and so on, they don't get holidays. So the holidays that we're talking about for a lot of this until certainly until the second half of this, of today's episode, they are, they're, I guess they're middle-class holidays. I mean, that's the difference with the grand tour. The grand tour is the, the elite. And now you've got a, a middle, a sort of white collar middle-class who are aspiring to join them. But Dominic, I don't want to bring up the Christian angle, but I'm going to, because obviously a holiday is a holy day. And yeah. if you're Catholic, you have loads of holy days. So the, the kind of shrinkage of holy days that workers can have is, is an index of, of Protestantism. And we talked yeah. in the first episode about how, you know, basically the first grand tourists are Catholics going on pilgrimages. So do you think that that, um, that sense Britain has of itself as an industrious Protestant, non-papist country. There is a kind of slight tension there. I mean, maybe so. Maybe they're trying to kind of reinvent the wheel a bit. So they're having to invent the idea of holidays because the traditional Catholic notion of a holiday has gone. They're having to invent the idea of foreign trips because the idea of pilgrimages has gone. Do you think that's? Do you think there's anything in that? And there's a bit in that. I mean, I think I tell you where you might you you might claim to see a sort of Protestant ethic, and that's the idea that about of holidays being good for you. You know, holidays being. Um, we right. talked in the Grand Tour episode about the the foundations of the Grand Tour and the idea that it would be kind of ethical to go on a on a Grand Tour. Yeah, you know the idea that about travel broadening the mind and all that sort of thing that that we're so familiar with, um, and also of course the idea that it is literally healthy. That as we discussed last time, going to the beach and drinking loads of seawater might make you better. And I think that is woven through today's episode as well. Um, the idea that your mental and physical health will be improved by going on holiday. And that's a way, I think, maybe for people not to feel guilty. And it's also a way for people to lobby for working men and women to get holidays too, to say, actually, in the long run, you'll have a more healthier and more productive workforce if you give them, you know, a week off or if they get a, as we're later, as we'll talk about later, a wakes week where they can go to the seaside. Just returning as is my won't to the, the religious angle. One of the things that I had not appreciated until I read Lucy Lethbridge's book was just how um, how deeply religious many of the kind of the great foundational figures in the history of tourism oh, yes. were. And the most yeah. famous of all, of course, is Thomas Cook, uh, who was a Baptist, you know, very high-minded, very frugal, teetotal, um, and yet <laughs> this... You know, he seems the most unsuitable person, basically, to have invented the package tour, which is what he does. Yeah, which is basically um, what he did, exactly. And, and the package tour is invented, I learned from Lucy's book, in 1841, when um, five, 500 people in Leicester want to go to Loughborough to attend a temperance <laughs> meeting. It it's is. so brilliant that, the, you know, that is how Benidorm and the dentist chair and, you know, this is, this is the kind of little, the little acorn from which that mighty oak of debauchery and it, drunkenness it's, it's will hilarious, come. Um, it's and, a hilarious juxtaposition, isn't it? That everybody who's getting wasted in a club in yeah. Magaluf <laughs> owes it to the temperance movement of the 1840s. Yeah. And so they all, they all have to get from, from, uh, from Leicester to Loughborough. And so what Cook does is he mass books train tickets. 
So trains have made this possible. And so he gets a discount and they go there and they arrive and it's a great, the whole occasion is a great success. And Cook raises this cheer, one cheer more for (laughs) teetotalism and railwayism. So I hope that, (laughs) which I shall certainly be... uh, be raising when I go on my holidays this summer. I can um, just see you in the clubs of Ibiza now, Tom. Yeah, yeah. leading, leading the revelers. One cheer more for teetotalism and railwayism. <laughs> I mean, I think it's fair yeah, to no, say it's, like, it's 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 forgotten its roots in that. But but that is, um, you know, so Thomas Cook is. I mean, he's a very earnest man, isn't he? He is. Um, he's he's an absolutely classic sort of Victorian, like the sort of, you know, the Quakers behind the chocolate industry and so on. Yeah. Um, he was, as you say, he was a Baptist from Derbyshire. Uh, his wife is a Sunday school teacher. He works as a wood turner, but also as a kind of pre-evangelical preacher. And he has this idea of, of temperance, you know, of, of this sort of temperance tourism that you'll, you'll get the trains, temperance meetings. And I guess the other thing that really makes his name is the taking people to the Great Exhibition. So the Great yeah. Exhibition is is ten years later, eighteen fifty one, and he basically books tickets for sixty five thousand people to go yeah. down to London, um, and they get there. So they get they get their accommodation as well. So they get to stay in kind of temperance hotels, and they get their entry tickets to the exhibition. And you can completely see how well two things: one, this is impossible pretty much before the the, the birth of the railways because yeah so hooray for railwayism hooray for the railway for railwayism exactly but also there is a kind of improving idea to it you know that you will get to see the nation's capital you will get to see the great exhibition and the marvels that industrial protestant capitalism has has brought you um and you can sort of also see why you know even at this point there are there are rivals. So there's a guy a little bit later called Henry Gaze who organizes railway trips. I'm not sure whether there's the same degree of him. I and he's a congregationalist, actually. So there probably is the same well, again, degree of, yeah. of temperance, enthusiasm. Yeah. Reli- Christianity at the heart of everything, Tom. Well, and, and of course, then tensions start to arise when in 1855, so that's what, four years after Great Exhibition, um, the first foreign trip is organized to Paris. Yeah. And Paris, of course, is a hotbed of... Uh, Catholicism and bad behavior and bad behavior generally. Um, and Cook, even once he starts organizing trips to, to Italy and Spain and you know, absolute sinks of papery, um, <laughs> he is having, he, I mean, he kind of issues warnings to stout Protestants, doesn't he? Um, warning them to watch out for priests and superstition and all this kind of yeah. stuff. And he's still offering discounts to, uh, to, to teetotalers and Baptists. <laughs> Well, the funny thing is that actually, clearly, in a way that we now have completely, well, I suppose people do behave badly, don't they, in, in churches and things. Sometimes when they go abroad, they wear inappropriate clothes or whatever. But there are amazing stories about people going to St. Peter's in Rome and having picnics during Mass. <laughs> See this? They have they take picnic hampers into St. Peter's during Mass. Yeah. And they have champagne and they... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because and I don't and presumably this is they just think oh this is all superstitious rubbish you know it's yeah, who cares let's have a picnic and yeah so it's not like Ian Paisley going on holiday is it I mean he's not they're not kind of doing it or do you think they are making a a statement of their proud Protestant contempt for it do you think they would do it well they wouldn't do it at home would they I don't know I mean do they just think it's all right I don't know I think they just think I think it's that curious thing that uh, anyone who's ever been on holiday as part of a group, so the sort of stag party or the sports tour, Tom, which you, of course, do, is the, is the classic example of that. I've been on a sports tour to St. Peter's. There you go. We played the Vatican. You played cricket in the Vatican, didn't you? Yeah, we played, we played cricket in St. Peter's Square, uh, and we had to do it very quickly before we got stopped by the police. So, yes, it's very similar. The Italians, if they were doing this podcast, might tell a different story about your cricket tour. They might see it in a very different light. Yeah, they might. They might say this is actually worse behavior than the champagne quaffing picnickers of but the was, 19th but century. No, I don't think so because we then went on and we met the Pope. So <laughs> he'd obviously forgiven us. Yeah, that didn't happen. But you see, that was, well, that's your, you know, in the last podcast, we were talking about Boswell, James Boswell meeting Russo and Voltaire. And I asked you if you had ever done anything like that. Me, of course, meeting Boncho Todorov from the Bulgarian Football Union. And and you said you hadn't done that, but you did because you met the Pope. Yeah, but when I say meet the Pope, there were about kind of 4,000 4, people who were meeting him oh, as well. okay. It was all in St. Peter's Square. I mean, it wasn't a kind of, oh, hello, your holiness. No. It wasn't a cricketing audience. <laughs> no, only two of us, Sebastian Folks, Peter Frankopan, they got yeah. to meet him. So they, they were the uh, they were the millords, and we were all the kind right. of humble retainers who had to stay behind. <laughs> oh, 
Yeah, we learned. Tom, the th- that's such a tragedy because you, of all people, <laughs> I mean, you'd have had so much to talk uh, about. Well, you could have told him about your, you know, your book and all that sort of thing. I- I'm afraid that's a kind of reflection of the invidious class structures that it is. Well, talking in. of invidious class structures, so there's an obviously an enormous amount of snobbery um, from the sort of the, I suppose, the grand tour class towards the people who are going on the Cooks tours. And this is the point at which you start to see people using words like they say the, there's there's a horde, there are swarms, there are a mob of tourists, they don't know how to behave, they don't know, you know, people are mocking the sort of yeah. the, the people who take up. People talk about Cooks Circus, I think. Um, yeah. and, and that sort of sense of, of, of holidays becoming something that are absolutely freighted with kind of social stratification and social prejudice. I think you get that from the mid 19th century. Isn't there also, so going on the grand tour, you're supposed to already yeah. know everything. You're supposed to know your Latin and your Greek and your classical antiquities and all that kind of thing. Um, but if you don't have that absolute kind of background in it, then you're going to need advice, aren't you? And I, I loved learning from Lucy Lethbridge's book that the publisher of what is widely thought to be the first guidebook was also the publisher of Byron, John Murray. So John Murray, who published Child Harold's Pilgrimage, is oh, a yes. great yeah. poetic uh, account of you know a, a, a doomed romantic figure crossing the, a, a Europe of ruins and romantic bandits. Is also, <laughs> you know, he, John Murray is also publishing um, what she called Mariana Stark, uh, which was published in 1820 travels on the continent um i love her list of what you need so you need pillows blankets pillowcases mosquito nets towels tablecloths napkins traveling chamber lock pistols pocket knives carving knife and fork a silver teapot ink powder pens razors straps and hones needles thread tape worsted and pins a thermometer a medicine chest with scales, weights, an ounce and half ounce, measures for liquids, a glass, pestle and mortar, tooth and hairbrushes. And I could go on because the paragraph is enormous. Um, when I was writing my most recent history of post-war Britain, so it's about the early 1980s, I kicked off by looking at American guidebooks and what they said about Britain, you know, the sort of Fodor's guide and the Let's Go guide to Britain in 1980-81. And they're hilarious. And I think guidebooks and phrase books are often a fantastic, fantastic indications of what people think of, of foreign countries. So, so Lucy Lethbridge <laughs> said of, of uh, Mariana Stark and this uh, Travels on the Continent, this first guidebook, that she understood that the underlying default position, even of the open-minded tourist, was of suspicion and fearfulness. Stark told her readers their fears were understandable and then brusquely how they might overcome them, which is... <laughs> Have you seen the phrase books? So there's a phrase book, yes, English Italian phrase, phrase, phrase book from 1828. Yeah. And at the top of the list of useful phrases, he has hurt, he bleeds. Do not weep, it will soon be cured, but it is a scratch. But also, I am ruined, I shall be scolded. Poor little creature that I am, where can I hide myself? She also cites one from 1874. <laughs> which I thought had the best of the lot. The carriage is near the precipice. One of the wheels is off. The axle tree is broken. She's very yeah, Italian. That hasn't, that hasn't changed because <laughs> this is one from the 1960s, the Let's phrase book. So if you're traveling to Italy, these are the phrases. Look out, be quiet, leave me alone. I should call a policeman. I urgently need an ironmonger. <laughs> where would, where would you, well, unchangeable. Where would you require that final, that final phrase? Yeah. Anyway, um, so yeah, you need a guidebook. You obviously suspicion of the food is the is another thing. So you don't really hear a lot of that from the grand tourists, but you start to hear that a lot in the nineteenth century, and of course later on with package tourism in the twentieth century. So you get all these people who talk about the sort of greasy ragouts that they are being given yeah. in Italy, and and people who say they they they're only going to subsist on boiled eggs or something. I mean, that's a very kind of nineteen sixties British attitude but but that's that's there right from the beginning isn't it it is and it was also in travelogues that you get the first mentions of pizza so people going to we talked in the last episode about people going to um to naples to to naples grand tour so 1843 a travelogue describes a pizza as a sort of cake made from flour lard eggs and garlic and then its next mention is in the gourmet's guide to europe 1903 Lieutenant Colonel Nathaniel Newnham Davis. He sounds like a splendid fellow. Is he a fan? He, do you know what he calls a pizza? He says it's like a kind of Yorkshire pudding. <laughs> um, <eat it. laughs> he does sound a tremendous chap. 
eaten either with <laughs> cheese or with anchovies and tomatoes, which is true because he's basically describing either a pizza margarita or a marinara, the two great Neapolitan yeah. pizzas. But a Yorkshire, I mean, how else would you I'm just quite tempted to, to, to do that. The Yorkshire pudding with anchovies. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. There was a brilliant pub in Cambridge, actually, in the 1990s that did uh, Yorkshire puddings with chilli, stuffed with chilli. Giant Yorkshire pudding stuffed with chilli con carne. Anyway, this, mm, is sure a, about that. this is a massive tangent. Uh, Dominic, I think we should have a, a, a break fairly soon. But before we do that, because I know that you want to go on to talk about spas. So we talked about Bath, yeah. didn't we, in the first episode. But um, We did. It turns out that German spas are a kind of different league. But before we do that, can I just different. could I could I just return to Dickens's pictures from Italy and give you a oh, breakdown do. of yeah. what he describes? Yes. Okay. So he goes to Avignon and um, he visits the uh, the rooms in which the Inquisition used to operate, and Dickens gets a guide who had a mysterious hag like way with her forefinger when approaching the remains of some new horror, looking back and walking stealthily and making horrible grimaces. So that's that's a very popular thing, isn't it? Still, is going yeah. to see sites of torture, suffering, all that kind of thing. Um, I, I Dickens love that then, when I go on holiday. Yeah, well, Dickens actually goes. To see, he sees a guillotining. Um, oh yeah. He so did. when he gets when he gets to Rome, um, yeah. he he actually watches it, and he's clearly absolutely fascinated by it. Uh, he goes to Leghorn, which is what the British called Livorno. Uh, yeah. Not many years ago, there was an assassination club there, the members of which bore no ill will to anybody in particular, but stabbed people, quite strangers to them, in the streets at night for the pleasure and excitement of the recreation. So that'd be fun. That's, you know. Well, yeah, but you don't join if you're a tourist, do you? I mean, you just well, have to know. live in fear of that I when mean, you're walking clearly the streets. A, Dickens would quite fancy it. Yeah. But it's, um, the, there's a kind of, there's a passage he gets to Piacenza. And he, he writes, sitting on this hillock where a bastion used to be and where a noisy fortress was in the time of the old Roman station here, I became aware that I have never known till now what it is to be lazy. Because Dickens is famously, oh. I mean, he's, an, he's not a man yeah. who's ever lazy. So hard working. But it's so typical of him that he's feeling lazy. He has to get out his notebook and write it down. That is very Dickensian. But it's also quite a tourist thing, isn't it? That in a way, I mean, it's, it's kind of Instagram. You can't enjoy a beautiful view unless you've taken a photograph of it and posted it. Yeah, you know, it's not real unless you've. It's not real it. unless you've written a postcard, you know, as was, or yeah. now you've you've photographed it, Instagrammed it, whatever. Um, and it's absolutely typical of of Dickens that the day after he has discovered what it is to be lazy, he's off again. It's such a delight to me to leave new scenes behind and still go on encountering newer scenes, and that again is absolutely part of the tourist experience. To this day, if we're going on a kind of, you know, a tour around, you know, I mean, the stereotype is the American or the Japanese tourist, isn't it, for Europeans that they yeah. turn up in, you know, today's. If it's Monday, it must be Paris. Yeah. So Dickens is kind of blazing a path there. Um, he is indeed. That, uh, that people will follow. You can never have too much Dickens. Uh, we will leave you with that. Uh, and when we come back, we will um, go to German spas. Let us plunge into those murky waters after the break, Tom. See you in a minute. Hello, welcome back to The Rest is History. We are on holiday, specifically we are on holiday in the Victorian period. And Dominic, um, we are heading off to Germany, aren't we, to enjoy the waters? Yeah, so in the last episode, Tom, we talked about the Grand Tour. Um, when people went to the list of destinations that people went to, there were some of the very familiar big names from today, so France, Italy. But there are also some that are perhaps a tiny bit more unfamiliar. Not, not that many people go to Switzerland anymore for their summer holiday. And um, British tourists are notoriously reluctant to go to Germany on holiday, which is actually a huge break with tradition and with history, because in the 18th and 19th centuries, Germany was an, a colossally popular destination for British holidaymakers. And, and you went to Germany for the same reason that you would have gone to Bath or to Brighton in the 18th century. So you go there partly for the social scene, but also you go because of your, your health. So spa tourism is a massive industry in the 19th century. And you were talking before the break about Lucy Lethbridge's book, Tourists. Brilliant, brilliant book, which I heartily recommend to all our listeners. And she has the most wonderful chapter in that book about um, the popularity of all these awful <laughs> sounding German spa towns. So there's a, a bloke. So a bloke in 1844 writes a book called Quacks and Quackery. And he says, 
A gang of crafty adventurers thrive richly upon English credulity and chuckle in their sleeve at English stupidity. And what he's basically talking about are all these hundreds of spas across France and Germany, which come with you know huge numbers of doctors. So I guess when people go to a spa today, you know, there's not a doctor present, is there? I mean, you don't have a kind of medical consultation. No, I've never been. Them. Have you ever been to a spa? No, yeah, I've been to a spa. Did, what do you do? Kind of drink hot water? No, I just lie in the. I just lie like a beached whale in their pool. Um, well, you know, my wife has treatments of various kinds. You know, I thought you had to drink hot water. For, for no, we're not. I'm not talking about going to like a German star spa. I'm talking about going to some fancy hotel. No, I'm, well, I mean, that's, that's what I'm talking different... about. You can't suddenly switch gears. And I, I wasn't thinking about those kind of spas. I was thinking about the the German ones with medicine balls and. No, no, no. Obviously, I'd never. I would never go within a hundred miles of such a place. Cures for corpulence. Well, you know what Lucy Lethbridge says about the German spas. There were bespoke treatments for every conceivable affliction with physicians on hand claiming every specialism. There were bone doctors, worm doctors, wind and water doctors. Treatments on offer included radioactive mud, sweat grottos, <laughs> <laughs> salle de mm. pulverisation, gas injections and percussion douches. Have What's you that, never what? have you never craved <laughs> a percussion <laughs> douche? What, what, what is a gas inject? I mean, well, they were, I don't know. I think they would. I think they would put gas into into your eyes, ears, and other orifices. They can't be injecting gas into your veins. I think, Can I they? they? I mean, they that yeah. can't be healthy. <laughs> They would. Here we go. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm reading from Lucy Lethbridge's book. At many spas, including Marienbad in Bohemia, there were gas baths while the patient sat in an enclosed tub into which warm, warm or cold gas was piped from below. One or two even had specialist gas baths for eyes and ears, where gas was injected via a small quill. Would you enjoy that? <laughs> No. <laughs> no. So I they wouldn't. would cover you in sand. That's another big, another big thing. Um, mm. Then they had these sort of communal pools, and she says of these pools, they were absolutely disgusting. People would compare them with mulligatawny soup because mm. they were because the spa waters were sort of you know they were strangely coloured anyway. But obviously you're yeah. sharing it with a load of Germans, a load of I mean, and and British visitors too. And you'd also drink the spa water, so you drink the same water that you'd bathe in. So that was that was what I was homing in on. That's what I know about these spas: is that you, the drinking is disgusting. I would never do that. I mean, that's derented. Do you know what a, a patient at Baden described? Do you know what he compared the spa water there with? He said it tastes like the washings of a gun barrel with a dash of rotten eggs. Nice. Yeah. Okay. So a, bit, a whiff of sulphur. Yeah. It's got to be warm. It's got to be sulphurous. Uh, it's got to have sloshed over a lot of corpulent bellies. That's my sense. It has done. How about this? I'm just reading bits. of th This book is so infectious that I'm just reading bits out now. Um, at Carlsbad, drinkers were even advised to wipe their teeth with stale bread or sage leaves to remove the mineral incrustation. I mean, imagine going to a spa and being told, here's some stale bread to wipe your teeth after you've bathed in mulligatawny soup and had a gas injection in, <laughs> in your eye. Do you know, the First World War, not all bad, if it put an end to that kind of nonsense. So some of these places obviously are still tremendously popular so i mentioned baden davos okay but that's in switzerland so that's a mountain is. resort isn't it so that's slightly is. isn't that slightly kind of later and classier uh well i think these german resorts are often uh, are considered very classy so they'll have the kind of casino they'll have but, a grand hotel Fichy, and they'll Fichy's have the most famous isn't it of all because obviously it's the role it plays in the second world war but they're kind of old but the sense i have of of davos is that um the idea that mountain air is good for you is a kind of later a later idea just on vichy hmm. if you're going to go to be forced to go back in time and go to any 19th century spa vichy is the one to go to because at vichy they banned salad because it gave you acid and made you drink wine and eat cheese so that's, that's a very so french. Kind of french provincial <laughs> take on the yeah. on the spa well no wonder petain chose it then <laughs> exactly there's a bloke called dr spengler and he goes to Davos in the 1850s. Not the famous Spengler, the no, decline of the West no, Spengler. No, a different man. Uh, and he says, gosh, this seems terribly healthy. And he opens his spa there. And Robert Louis Stevenson goes there in 1880s. Oh, he's dying, isn't he? So the whole kind of consumption thing. So that goes back to Exactly. Kids. And the, his doctor, Stevenson's doctor, actually seems quite a decent fellow. He, he put him on a diet of red meat, lots of wine and milk, and told him to work no more than three hours a day. 
And that sounds, I mean, that sounds great. And, and Stevenson actually, he hated it. He went home. He said, uh, and you know what he really objected to? He objected to the scenery. He said monotonous he? and monstrous. Yeah, which mm. is demented because Davos, you know, you go for the scenery. So that is an interesting point, is people's, people's relationship to scenery. So obviously that is culturally determined because famously yeah. through the Middle Ages up until, what is it, Petrarch goes up a hill, goes up a mountain. People are not interested in the rugged grandeur and sublime perspectives provided by the Alps. No. But then something changes. And I guess it's, it's the romantic sublime, isn't it? It's, uh, it is the romantic a, a, a sublime. And the sort of, I suppose, you have the picturesque, don't you? And the, we talked about that a little bit with the Grand Tour. And then mm. the sublime, um, the, the, the glories of nature. And, and to some extent, that has never left us. Byron famously goes to Switzerland as part of his Grand Tour, uh, you know, on his 1816 trip flight from from england um where he writes frank you know mary shelley writes frankenstein byron writes um more of child harold um and he is very very upset when he is posing moodily on a mountain and a group of english tourists come up and start saying oh it's lovely <laughs> lovely nature yeah and he goes happens, off into a kind of massive aristocratic hissy fit about this and that's very well, much what constant. he should have done tom mm. is he should have what? gone to iceland because that's where you really go for the glories of nature and to get away from it all. So people start going there in the mid 19th century for precisely this reason, because everywhere else has become too crowded. So just one, I, I know that Lucy Lethbridge writes about this, but again, we, I'm so sorry if we just quote, but she has this fabulous quotation from Augustus Hare in 1854 on the Matterhorn. I'm very glad to have seen it, but if I can help it, nothing shall ever induce me to see it again. Oh, wow. But I often feel like that about places I've been on holiday. Don't you? Hmm. You go and see something, you think, that's nice, I've seen it, but I'm not going to see it again. Do you know, I... I mean, I felt a bit like that, a little bit like that about Disney World. I don't think I'd ever confess to myself that I felt like that about a beautiful mountain. Right. But you're probably right. Okay. Because actually, I've been to Iceland, and I slightly felt that about Iceland. Did you? I think Iceland is brilliant. I mean, I'm, I'm glad to have seen it. I'm glad to have seen it, but I, I'm not sure I'd go there again to see it, if you see what I mean. Well, people started going to Iceland. I mean, it's very famous because it's, in a way, we're going to be doing a couple of podcasts on J.R.R. Tolkien. Um, in a few weeks, aren't we? And William Morris's trip to Iceland and his obsession with the Norse myths and with the kind of spirit of the North, um, that that leads ultimately to Tolkien and The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. So no Icelandic holiday, no mm. uh, Amazon Prime series. Anyway, that's by the by. But that is another trend, isn't it? That, again, is absolutely uh, a part of the contemporary travel industry that – you're always looking for the next place, the next, the place that has been undiscovered, that is, uh, isn't spoiled, that, um, you know, you yeah. go further and further afield. And people were doing that in the 19th century. So when people went to Italy, people would go and see demonstrations of pasta making where Italians would be making pasta in a way that they no longer made pasta. <laughs> right. So they were just doing it to keep the tourists happy. So pasta making had become mechanized just in the same way that now if you go to, I don't know, Mexico or something, in villages, or Peru, people will be doing their traditional weaving. But, I mean, that's not how most Mexicans and Peruvians spend their time or indeed the kind of clothes they wear. The classic novel, and when I say novel, I really mean film because I always think of it in terms of the film, is um, Room of the View. Yeah, of course. And that's, that's the – so the Grand Tour does have a kind of longevity because all the people who are doing – it's become much more feminized, I think, at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century. So young women will now go to Italy. And if you read, for example, particularly Americans, so Henry James's books are all about um, aristocratic, well, not aristocratic, rich young American heiresses going to... Daisy Miller. Um, yeah, or... Uh, and they all die of malaria and things. So, Millie yeah. Thiel in um, in The Wings of the Dove or something. They're all, they're all going to sort of Venice or Rome or Florence. Are you a fan of um, A Room of the View, The Merchant Ivory? I haven't seen it for ages. Okay, so it Liam is... Liam Forster's book. Absolutely one of Sadie's favourite films. Uh, Merchant Ivory's adaptation of E.M. Forster's Room of the View. Was it Lucy Honeychurch goes to Florence... Yeah. And uh, she's in the um, she's accompanied by her uh, um, kind of companion, isn't he? Maggie Smith, who is absolute pain. Brilliant, <laughs> brilliant performance. And she meets Eleanor Leviche, who is a, a novelist with romantic dreams of Italy. And uh, Lucy Honeychurch, a.k.a. Um, is that Helena Bonham Carter? 
aka Helena Bonham Carter, yeah, is rather sulkily going around with her Baedeker. The Baedeker is the um, oh, the German the guidebook. It gives you away the German guidebook. And Eleanor Levish says, "Throw away the Baedeker." Yeah, and talks about you know what the uh, the true Italy is only to be found by patient observation. And then um, Lucy goes off and uh, has a fling with Julian Sands, the world's worst actor. Yes, nature, beauty. I love you. Astonishingly oh. good film. Huge Let's film. hope he's not listening to this to this podcast, Tom. Oh, no, I think he'd accept it. <laughs> is it that he's a bad actor? I mean, <laughs> he's the worst actor ever. Is he a worse actor than than Jason Connery? Uh, yes. The uh, the second yes. incarnation of the hooded man and Robin of Sherwood. Yes, he is. I urge you to watch Room of the View and watch him try and emote. I love okay, you. Fine. I mean, it's astonishingly bad. Worse than me. One last note on William Morris going to Iceland. I had I had promised I had promised you that I would tell you what he thought of Iceland. He didn't. He thought Iceland generally was brilliant, but he didn't like Reykjavik. He said, um, "Not a very attractive place, but better than a north country town in England." So that kind of thing of always having an English comparison. But yeah. so he came back to England from Iceland and somebody said to Burn Jones, his mate Burn Jones, what's Morris like? Um, and uh, Burn Jones said, oh, he's awful. He's come back smelling of raw fish and talking of Iceland more than ever. And people in Iceland, you know what they thought of Morris? They, they remembered him as a man who just went around talking about his strong views on probate and income tax. That's odd. <laughs> it's, I thought he'd be going on about all the um, the elves. Because you know the great thing about Iceland? No, Anna, clearly not. He was just talking about his tax return. I don't know whether this is a story that, that Iceland has just held gullible tourists, but that they are legally obliged when they're building a road to check that they're not going through a place where elves live. So you'll be yeah, going I've on a perfectly that. straight road, and then they'll kind of go around on a curve because uh, there's the elves are living there. So yeah, it's a great country. I've heard that. Um, but I think Icelanders tell that story in order to, mm. you know, in the same way that, I don't know, uh, the Italians would make pasta in the 19th century. They do it because they know the tourists love to hear it. Yeah, I, well, that, that, I that's my suspicion. But if, we ha if anybody from Iceland is listening and could let us know whether, whether people in Iceland really, you know, is road building really affected <laughs> by whether elves are in the way or not? Okay, yeah, we'd love now, to Tom, know. Tom, we've gone completely off piece. We've gone completely off piece now. Let us, let us um, get back to holidays. So obviously, all this period, most people are not going on holiday abroad because they can't. They can't afford it. They can't afford the tickets to get the, the boat train. But they are going on Sundays and things because the railway, they can do day trips. Or if you work in an English sort of mill town or industrial town, you may get a wakes week. And the wakes week is when the, the factory owners will clean the factory and uh, sort out all the equipment and basically service all the equipment. So you get a week off the whole, the whole town effectively. Oh, right. So like an inset day. At school. Like an inset day, like an inset week. Yeah. And they will all go to the seaside. And we talked a little bit about the seaside before um, with Brighton and stuff in our last podcast. But seaside resorts are a real 19th century story. And actually, do you know where the world's first true sort of seaside – I mean, we did talk about Brighton, but the world's first seaside spa resort was, Tom. No. Spa will give it away. It was to the Germans again. So oh. this is a place called Heiligendam on the Baltic coast in Mecklenburg. And this was founded in 1793 by the Grand Duke of Mecklenburg. Well, I, I was swimming in the Baltic only this summer, and it was very bracing, I have to say. Did you feel healthy um, for it? Did, did you drink it? I did. I didn't drink it. No. Although the Baltic's not very salty. So you, you could glug could it down. Drink it? <laughs> Yeah, mm. I could set up my own um, my own spa <laughs> yes. with gas injections. Dominic Sandbrook's spa, yes. Pleasure Island, my pleasure Corpulence Island. treatment, um, yeah. Um, so there's a big thing of, in Germany, in 19th century Germany, for, spa, for sort of seaside spas. There are all these islands, there's Rügen and there's Usedom. There are all these places. If you ever read Thomas Mann's book, Buddenbrooks, brilliant novel, actually, yeah. about a German family, they're always going to Travemunde, which is near Lübeck. And actually, if you, even if you go there now, they have this particular style of architecture called resort architecture, lots of lovely white buildings, sort of slightly clapperboardish, but very ornate. Um, and you can imagine, we often say on this podcast, if you could go back in time, what would you be? I mean, the idea of being a sort of Prussian general. Oh, you'd be a general, not a bourgeois. I'd be a bit of both, actually. I'd be a retired general who's now a bourgeois um, factory owner. Yes. Uh, and you'd be old enough not to have to fight in the, in the First World War. 
precise. Well, and I'd, that that raises the issue of um, would my children be fighting the First World War? So that's and actually, you know, what's going to happen to my grandchildren? So it's becoming a bit of a troubling scenario yes. now. But maybe I can, in an alternative reality, I can coax Germany away. Or maybe I yes. can do the thing I've always wanted to do, which is to strike a lasting Anglo-German alliance against the French. And I'll do that in my spa resort. Maybe in this alternate reality, the Kaiser does wear the right shoes. Well, we'll be coming to the Kaiser a little bit later. So the Germans have resorts. Also, Tom, the Americans have resorts. So, you know, the first, the name of the first American resort? Uh, no. See, this is shameful because I actually sent it to you in the notes um, before <laughs> this episode. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's I've so drawn back the work. curtain there for the listeners, so they they <laughs> see the full horror of making this podcast. It's a place called Cape May in New Jersey. Cape May, Cape? No, Cape May sounds like it's clearly a person. No, oh, I was going to say Cape May sounds like a kind of actress. Yeah, it's Cape. Cape May could be a relative of Theresa May. Um, anyway, <laughs> listen, it's um, it's Cape May, and it's in New Jersey, and you can go there initially from Philadelphia on a stagecoach. Uh, but then there's people start going after the war of 1812 in steamboats and they have boarding houses and hotels and all these kinds of things. And Cape May still very much, it, it's been in decline, I believe, uh, because basically nobody goes to New Jersey on holiday anymore, but, um, it still trades as America's first seaside resort. I'd like to go. Well, you should. I'd really like to go. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to go to New Jersey and do the Sopranos trail. So I could combine okay. the two. Abraham Lincoln went to Cape May. So, well, you know, it's good enough for Abe, honest Abe. Exactly. Abraham Lincoln did not, however, go to Florida. And Florida is the big seaside story, obviously. So that was set up by a man called Henry Flagler, who was a standard oil baron. And he built railroads in Florida. And he basically created the first place he created was what they, I believe they pronounce St. Augustine um, as a sort of big resort. And then Miami and Palm Beach. And all these kinds of places, and you know, and when is Cal when is so, California becoming a well? California, I don't think California becomes an attraction. California is too far, isn't it? I mean, well, not if you're in California. Well, no, obviously, I mean, people are going to the beach if they're in California, but I mean, East Coast Americans are going, you know, to well, if they're not going to New Jersey, they're going to Florida on on Henry yeah. Flagler's railroads. When is um, I don't know all the famous beaches in California? When are they starting right. to be colonized? That's a very good question. I don't actually know the answer. I'd be interested. Maybe our listeners can, because obviously the heyday of Californian beaches really feels like the 50s and 60s, doesn't it? Yeah. But people must have been going to the beach before that. But talking of beaches, since we are British, Tom, it would be remiss of us not to mention the most glamorous resort of all, the great town of Blackpool. Um, so Blackpool was nothing before the really arrival of the, of the railways. So there was a stagecoach from Manchester and Halifax to Blackpool in the late 18th century. But then there's a branch line that is built in 1846. And then Blackpool just becomes, it just goes through the roof. So people go on these wakes weeks. They basically have the week off from the mill because they're refitting all the equipment. So they just, the whole town will basically get on the train and pile into Blackpool for the week and just ride donkeys and Let's laugh yep. at music hall comedians and, and they build hats. piers and they, but Blackpool is, is a real trend. I mean, now the temptation for a lot of people in Britain is to laugh at Blackpool, but they are the, they're the, ta the first town in the world to have all electric power. Um, they have electric street lighting. They have the illuminations. So it's, again, it's kind of Vegas. It's, it's blazing a path for Vegas. Oh, absolutely. Blackpool has the world's first electric tramway. It has the largest, when the Blackpool Tower is built in the 1890s, I think it's 1894, it is the largest, the tallest building in the entire British Empire. They have the Pleasure Beach and they have the first wooden roller coaster in Britain in uh, 1907. And, and Blackpool is getting millions of visitors a year. So people who are, you know, working class visitors, people who have previously been shut out of holidays because of things like wakes weeks because of more paternalistic employers and things i mean they still have no statutory right to a holiday but they're going in absolutely colossal numbers well i will be going next year to blackpool yeah on holiday so my friend jamie and i we yeah. uh, last last year we um we did this thing where we just went in a straight line across britain and next year we're going to go from suffolk to blackpool in a kind of straight line so we're going to end up in blackpool so looking forward have you to been it. to blackpool recently i've never been to blackpool See, I have been to Blackpool. Although Sadie was born there. Was she? And? I filmed in Blackpool. Um, 
we may have listeners from Blackpool, so I, I'm weighing my words carefully. It's probably not the top of my list of holiday destinations, to be quite honest with you. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Um, I should be interested to hear what you make of it. Hopefully, you'll be able to share your views uh, with the listeners. Dom, our producer, is putting a note in the chat that says, Pleasure Beach in Blackpool, the original Pleasure Island, question mark. So the Pleasure Beach was uh, built in 1896, Dom. And um, this tremendous amusement park and, you know, very, very popular part of the reason why so many people went. But Tom, we've, we've almost reached the First World War, haven't we? And we have. The First World War began with a lot of people on holiday. So the Kaiser, very much a friend of the rest is history, slightly implausibly, um, a regular, re <laughs> regular guest star on this podcast. He went on, he was on holiday for much of the July crisis running up to the outbreak of the First World War, which to me always sort of completely gives the lie to the idea that the Kaiser had in a sinister. Was he not on holiday in, was it Norway? He was. He was in the fjords. He was in Norway because I think I have seen there was some kind of weird chair he had. The Kaiser's chair. The Kaiser's chair. And I think he was sitting in it when the news was brought to him of the assassination of Franz Ferdinand. No, he w he was in Berlin when that happened. But it, maybe some news was 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 brought to him. I'm imagining it then. But Britain is on holiday um, as we slide into war. So there's a bank holiday Monday the third of August. Um, lots of people are playing. It's it's the most it's the oldest cri the date of the oldest cricket festival in England. Tom, the Canterbury Cricket Week. I don't know what that I is. Can't, I mean, typical continental plot, isn't it, to start a war when the cricket festival's on? So Surrey are playing Nottinghamshire at the Oval. Massive crowds. Uh, the Windsor and Eton regatta. Never such innocence again. Yeah. Well, I think we should end with that Larkin poem because it's the it's the bank holiday, the third of August. Um, the previous night, the Kaiser has sent an ultimatum to Belgium, saying we want free passage. Um, the Belgians are clearly going to resist. So all basically, Britain is on holiday, um, but in in Westminster, the politicians are meeting, and it's the very next day that Germany invaded Belgium and Britain declared war on Germany. And with that, Tom, the podcast, this episode of The Rest is History must come to an end. But shall we end with that Larkin poem? Why not? Since it's all about holidays. Well, and not only that, but we are recording this on the 100th anniversary of Philip Larkin's birthday. So it seems an entirely fitting tribute. I, I have it in front of me. And for once, I will read it in my own voice rather than a, a ludicrous other voice. Here we go. 1914 by Philip Larkin. Those long, uneven lines, standing as patiently as if they were stretched outside the Oval or Villa Park, the crowns of hats, the sun on moustached, archaic faces, grinning as if it were all an August bank holiday lark, and the shut shops, the bleached established names on the sun blinds, the farthings and sovereigns and dark-clothed children at play, called after kings and queens, the tin advertisements for cocoa and twist, and the pubs wide open all day. And the countryside not caring, the place names all hazed over with flowering grasses, and fields shadowing doomsday lines under wheat's restless silence, the differently dressed servants with tiny rooms in huge houses, the dust behind limousines. Never such innocence, never before or since, has changed itself to past without a word, the men leaving the gardens tidy, the thousands of marriages lasting a little while longer. Never such innocence again. Goodbye. Bye-bye.